G'day guys, or welcome to this episode of Aussie English. Today I have Ross McGibbon, who is a snake enthusiast, or would you call yourself a reptile enthusiast? Do you pick a team? Or uh, no, mate. Um, snakes are probably my favourite out of all reptiles. Uh, they're definitely what I focus on mainly. But um, I'm definitely a reptile enthusiast. Uh, I guess an amateur herpetologist. I study them in my spare time. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, and then, yeah, the wildlife photography as well. Well, that's it. So, the first question I have for you is, um, where are you from and where did you grow up down under and what do you do for a crust? What's your day do- your day job versus uh, the photography thing? Well, originally from, I'm, I'm in WA um, in Fremantle at the moment. I've been here for the last two years, but I'm a Queensland boy, as you might be able to tell by my Queen- very Queensland accent. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I grew up uh, in kind of a lot of different parts of Queensland, um, the Gold Coast uh, for 10 years, and then mum shipped us out to Emerald, Queensland, which is a couple hours inland of Rockhampton. So, uh, country town, big mining town, and we ended up on a farm out there. So, uh, a bit of a farm background, um, and then obviously later in life, uh, joined the army when I was 20, uh, joined as a firefighter, uh, and I've basically stuck with that career the whole time. Yep. Uh, and that's about three years ago, I just combined my passion for uh, wildlife photography, um, traveling, and then reptiles all into one sort of hobby, and then just uh, started doing wildlife photography on the side. Yeah, far out. So, were you, I was, when I was a kid, my parents used to always take me to um, my grandparents' farm in Bendigo, and there would always be, it was always dry, rocks everywhere, really flat rocks, so they were the perfect kind for lifting up and finding snakes and spiders and lizards and stuff. Were you doing that ever since you were a little kid? Well, for me, it started off with dinosaurs. I was absolutely obsessed with dinosaurs, uh, and then once we got moved up to Emerald, um, I started to realize that, you know, I started to be out in the bush more and I started to realize that, hey, you know, these reptiles are like living versions, miniature versions of dinosaurs. So, um, my my obsession sort of quickly went from dinosaurs over to reptiles and um, I was one of those kids at school that was just sneaking out of class to be in the bush all the time and catching reptiles and, and, and doing the sort of same sort of thing, you know, you might have been doing as a kid, just just uh, being out in the bush and, and, and enjoying, you know, what I, whatever I could find. Um, and then when I was about 11 years old, we moved out to a farm. Um, obviously, my mum sort of started up a relationship with a guy who was a farmer. Um, and that was a, a big contrast to what, um, uh, well, firstly, he, he had the mentality of, you know, any any snake, um, a good snake's a dead snake, basically. Yeah, so, pretty much all which farmers, is a, right? <laughs> pretty much all farmers, you know. They, they don't bother learning about them. They don't care. Uh, they just see them as a pest. They don't see them as native wildlife uh, and basically, uh, they they kill them all, regardless of whether they're non venomous, venomous, uh, a legless lizard, even. Are they um, allowed to do that? That's one of those questions that I hear about working. I worked at the museum when I was doing my um my studies, and we did quite a lot of surveys. We'd have to go out into you know the Grampians and into the Alps here in Victoria and catch everything. And I remember quite often they were saying. Because they'd talk to farmers and they'd be like, oh, I just kill them. And they're like, that's like a $20,000 fine, you know, if you kill yeah. one of these animals and people find out about it. So, what are the sort of rules with that? Well, this is the thing. Um, there's a bit of a gray area. So, first and foremost, all native wildlife in Australia is protected, yeah. including every species of reptile, including snakes. Um, if you kill one of these snakes uh, indiscriminately and um, someone has the proof, uh, to then pass on to the, you know, Environmental Protection Agency or, or whatever government body um, is in that state. If they have the proof, then they can, uh, you, you can then receive a fine. But there's a grey area that says you can um, protect your personal safety with whatever means necessary. So um, people sort of take that on board and they go, all right, well, there's a loophole here. I can kill snakes because snakes are aggressive. Uh, and all they have to do is say, oh, I was feared for my life, I feared for my family's life, and they can indiscriminately kill snakes. What it, what it really means is if a snake is advancing towards you in a, in a threatening behavior, you can grab whatever's nearest to defend yourself. That, that is allowed. What it doesn't include is seeing a snake down in the chook pen, um, running up to the house, grabbing a gun, going down and shooting that snake just for being a snake. And that's really? what, so what even, uh, even that you can't do on your own property? Uh, no, no. So they're protected wildlife and that does come under, um, you know, the law that you cannot go and kill that animal just for being there or just for being a snake. Um, but again, there's those loopholes 
and what people do on their own property is very rarely ever seen by the general public, yeah. and they can get and they can get away with it. So uh, that's sort of where that sort of behaviour comes about, and it's a mentality that's taught from kids from a young age in the country. Uh, the older parents, uh, they're not learning anything about the natural. Um, uh, and I'm being ge- very general. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. And and I'm speaking from my experience, from what my stepfather was like. They only know agricultural um, upbringings. They don't really know about the natural world. Um, their their family and their generations have changed the the land uh, many years before. They've cleared it. Uh, they've destroyed a lot of the natural habitat for natural wildlife. Then you get these snakes that feed on rats and mice, like brown snakes and taipans and, and species like that. Um, and then they're attracted to the home yeah. um, because, you know, farmers are feeding their chickens with grain. They've got all their horse feed in their hay and all this stuff that creates a great environment for rats and mice to breed, right? Then you've got the snake who used to have all this land and now it's all cleared and it's still trying to survive. So it's trying to eke out this existence in a very altered landscape to what it was. But what they're doing is providing this great food source that then those, rats, those snakes can come and exploit. Plus, they've got so much mess and rubbish and tin laying around. Yeah. You've got all these great hiding spots because they don't keep any of it clean um, and tidy. That was always one of those things that I was always thinking because I interviewed a guy from Queensland from the Sunshine Coast who was a snake hunter and he was talking about how he'd always get caught out to houses and it's always they just yeah. leave tin and, and wood piles and it's like, man, that is the perfect thing you need to do if you want to attract snakes to your house is just leave a, a heap of flat tin panels that are going to warm up in the in the day, you know, flat on the grass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and what they don't understand is, is snakes need to thermoregulate. So, um, their whole... Um the whole makeup is is designed to operate off being at an optimum body temperature. So yeah. if they can remain very safe underneath a piece of tin that then warms up under the sun and they don't have to expose themselves, exactly. that's a perfect shelter site for them. When they're warm enough, they'll come out to hunt and you've just created this perfect storm to have snakes by having a really messy property, all these rats and mice running around. So is there a lot is that a lot of your work too when you're out, you know, creating these videos on YouTube and taking these amazing um, photos is a lot of your work also interacting with people and trying to educate them personally on that sort of behavior and avoiding those kinds of things to be safer around their properties and not just, you know, I'll do whatever I want and if a snake's there I'm going to kill it. That is, um, first and foremost, what I started out doing um, on the Sunshine Coast. I became a professional snake catcher. So uh, like the guy you were talking about before, it was my full-time uh, role when I wasn't being a firefighter. Basically, on my days off, I was a full-time snake catcher. Um, and we, you know, we get up to 10 jobs a day on the Sunshine yeah. Coast. It's a very populated area for snakes, not to scare anyone. It's just got a, a very rich biodiversity. <laughs> if you don't like snakes, guys, come to Victoria. You'll be fine. There's very yeah, few yeah. of them. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, like, we, yeah, we'd be out um, educating a lot of the public on our snake calls, but it wasn't really enough. And then you've got these phenomenal tools like Facebook where old snake educators used to have to go to schools and educate 20 kids at a time. Yep. Now, you know, just by creating a video on Facebook, you can put it out there for the world to see. And I've just put one out recently about brown snakes chasing people and yep. explaining that. And you might have caught that one. And, you know, that's had about nearly 9,000 shares um, and it's had a lot of positive feedback because it helps people understand snakes more because they're very, very misunderstood animals. Well, talking about that, why are Australian snakes so dangerous when we move on to this topic? Why are they so venomous and why are they so misunderstood as well to get you going? Cool. Well, venomous and dangerous are two different things. Obviously, um, everyone's heard about how much we have uh, such toxic snakes in Australia, but the problem is... Um, those tests have been performed on mice. So there was a thing called the LD50 test, uh, which they did. Um, I can't remember exactly what year, but it was some time ago. Uh, and what they did is they tested all the snake venoms on mice. Uh, and now what they did is they've come up a list with a list from those results um, of the top, say, 25 most venomous snakes in the world. And Australia has, uh, you know, a good 15 or 20 of those I- in that uh, list. Now, everyone thinks now that, oh, we've got these super, super toxic snakes, but what they don't quite understand is that those results don't exactly correlate over to humans. They're performed on mice. Yep. I'll give you a good example of how, how it really doesn't work 
in the sense that everyone thinks it is. You've got the Sydney funnel web spider who can kill a human, um, but yet its venom is very effe- uh, ineffective on mice. So now if you, you know, test all these snake venoms on mice, <laughs> you're going to come up with this, you know, very scary looking results towards humans. And, and we really can't sort of correlate the two. Uh, we can only sort of pick out um, certain things that does. So anyway, Australia's got this massive reputation for having all these venomous snakes. What we don't understand is that statistics prove that we only have um, an average of two snake bite deaths a year, which is very low. Um, that's that's one of those things, sorry to interrupt you, that always blows my mind. When I was looking up some of the stats on um, animal-related deaths in Australia, all the animals that you would imagine aren't scary, are benign, are the ones that will actually F you up and kill you at the end uh-huh. of the day, right? Like, I think, you know, I think it was like 30 deaths a year from horses. Kangaroos kill more people than sharks in car accidents. And yep. so, it is weird that it's completely skewed and that Australia has this kind of like oh, we need to, you know, wear as a badge of honour all these dangerous animals, they're deadly, watch out. But in actual fact, it's all these other animals like dogs and kangaroos and goats or whatever that'll actually kill people and not necessarily yeah. spiders, snakes, sharks. Exactly. I, I was reading a, a, a big write-up on it uh, not too long ago and I think, you know, all our venomous creatures, including snakes, uh, crocodiles, oh, sorry, not venomous, all our dangerous creatures, in, including our snakes, our crocodiles, our sharks, our marine, dangerous marine life, it all amounts to about five deaths on average a year. And yep. then you get something like, you know, this cute little honeybee, this introduced honeybee <laughs> kill, killing 10 people a year. And, you know, you got this really skewed mentality that we need to go out and kill all these snakes, but yet you've got all these honeybees flying around everyone's flowers and backyards and stuff, and you don't have the parents running out in a, in a, in a fit of, like, panic killing all these honeybees yeah. like that would a snake, yet the snake, you know, gets this really bad rap in Australia. So well, imagine, imagine them going out there to fish and chip shops and just, like, beating the hell out of all of those pan... Like, um, <laughs> all the dim sims and everything because they're causing obesity and heart disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, um, driving your car, you know, we have yeah. around between three and a half, four and a half thousand car-related deaths. Yeah. That is phenomenal when you compare that to snakes. Yet, you know, there's... There's very little fear about jumping in your car and going down the street. You know what I mean? Is there even a word for that kind of a phobia? I don't think anyone has a phobia of um, of cars, but you've got arachnophobia. I'm sure there's phobias yep. of sharks, and yet, yeah, it yep. is. It is funny how it's kind of like irrational. It is. It's very irrational, and that's what you know. As a snake educator and someone who who puts a lot of time into to learning about these topics, the more I learn, um, and the more crazy people on Facebook I, I meet. Um, it's just staggering how many people just have this really skewed uh, version of how dangerous, you know, our native fauna is when really all of that stuff needs to be preserved and we could put our efforts into, um, you know, doing more constructive things uh, with our time instead of getting on Facebook and carrying on about how dangerous snakes are, you know, why not learn more about them so that you realise they're not so dangerous like a lot of the professionals do. Well, what are some of the misconceptions that the average person that you encounter have um, with regards to snakes? Um, basically, I'll, I'll start off with snakes being territorial. A, a lot of people will see a snake act defensively towards them and they'll be like, oh, this snake is chasing me out of its territory. It's taken up residence in my home. It's marked that residence out as its territory and now it's trying to chase me out of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go get my gun and kill it. Now, snakes are not territorial animals. What they have is a home range, just like you or I do. You know, we we live in a town. uh, We know where our food is. We know where our shelter is. um, And we know, you know, where the nightclubs are to go out and find females. But, (laughs) but, you know, if you correlate that to a snake, he has his home range. He kind of knows where everything is. Uh, He knows the habits, habits, uh, sorry, the habits of the occupants because he's grown up there. Um, he or she, sorry, um, and they're only going to defend their personal safety. So when they confront a snake, everyone thinks, oh, this snake is attacking me, it's being aggressive at me. But what they're doing is they're just seeing defensive behavior because it's very important to understand that snakes look up from the ground, they see this large animal, and in the wild, that's a predator to a large animal. So anything that's larger than them, they see as a threat to them. Even cars, I get these people going, oh, if they're not aggressive, then 
why was it striking at my car when I pulled up next to it on the road? And it's like the snake doesn't have Google and it can't <laughs> on and see the latest model of Toyota and go, oh, that's not a person. Yeah. It just looks up, it sees something big and intimidating and it just switches into defensive mode. That's all they do. And well, that-, that was really interesting when you showed that video recently with the brown snake, right? Can you explain what exactly was going on in that video and, and the point of it? Because it was, it was really, really interesting. Yeah, so for that particular video, we were out filming venomous snakes. Um, we'd come across one on the road um, and we got out to identify it as a brown snake. We're actually looking for inland taipans. We were right in the middle of Australia um, in, in northeast South Australia. and you got a, a death mission. wish. you got a death wish, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right out in the middle of nowhere and trying to look around <laughs> for snakes. But, um, you know, we got out, realized it was a brown snake. I uh, thought, oh, we'll just grab a quick bit of footage because we try and film everything we come across um, because you never know what, you know, the animal's going to do and how you'll be able to use that footage to sort of educate the public later on. So um, I went up behind it. Um, my friend Richie was filming me, uh, and as I got close to it, it did a 180, and that's where the video starts. Yep. Uh, it's done a 180 at me. Uh, it's advanced towards me uh, in a de- in defensive, I guess, in a defensive manner, thinking that I'm a large predator about to hurt it. Um, as I walk backwards, and all I had to do was walk backwards. I didn't have to run. I didn't have to panic. I just walked backwards. The snake advanced towards me and saw it, until it saw its first opportunity to flee, and yeah. that's when it ducked down that uh, soil crack that you can see. And that was a perfect example of how a snake will act defensively towards you, try to get you on the back foot, get you to just basically leave it alone and get away. Um, a lot of people mistake that behavior for chasing And they call it chasing because they believe that the snake is trying to advance towards them with intention to bite them because everyone thinks that they want to bite you and kill you. And it's it's just not the case. They put on this big bluff display. Uh, A lot of it's mock striking and bluffing. A lot of it's even done with a closed mouth. Um, And I've witnessed this many, many, many times while I've been out filming venomous snakes and as a snake catcher. I know that a lot of it's just bluff, but it can result in a bite if you do not leave it alone. So... Where accidents happen is if you don't see the snake, yeah. acts defensively towards you and you keep moving around, it's just thinking, oh, this thing's trying to kill me. It acts defensively and if you are close enough, they can result in a bite. Yeah, because I've heard that quite often they're not actually interested in wasting venom on things they know are predators because there's no real point, right? It's a waste of venom. They're not going to consume you and they have to create that venom again to try and hunt later. Exactly. You pretty much sort of nailed it on the head. Um, Venom isn't really used by Australian snakes in defense. The only time that's really used is in uh, things like your spitting cobras. And they've had, you know, thousands and thousands more years of large predators to deal with. So they rear up and they spit up into the eyes of um, your perceived predator to to fortunately we got none of them here except unless you go to a zoo and you're harry potter and the glass breaks or whatever right like (laughs) yeah yeah exactly so we you know we don't have to worry about any snakes spitting venom in our eyes uh what we need to be wary of is just how to act when that when we do see a snake um and and we can go on to that uh in in a bit more but just for the whole defensive um snakes using venom for defensive purposes there's no snake in australia that can kill a human that quickly um, to stop it from killing the snake. Yeah. So, you know, its venom is absolutely useless it, as used in a defensive manner. Yeah. So first things first, they're not going to try and use that. But the thing is, a snake is a snake. It's a long cylindrical animal. And the only thing it has to defend itself is, you know, bluff type behavior and acting assertively. And then last resort, it, it may bite. And a good... Um, a good statistic I like to, to put out there is the Australian brown snake is the eastern brown is the one that is responsible for the most amount of deaths in Australia, um, and that's the one that everyone fears, and that's why I did that video. But um, there's a statistic they've collected from snake bite history that that brown snake will only envenom its victim or the bite victim around 20 to 40 percent of the time. Now, so that means you can poke the thing between what three and five times before you'll get done. <laughs> yeah, you, you've basically, you know, you, if we want to make a bit of a joke out of it, you've basically got uh, the odds in your favour of mucking around with a snake. But um, to to be more serious, uh, that 
all that does is uh, sh- that statistic, it shows the general public that they're not trying to use venom as a defensive um, mechanism. The venom is only just a byproduct of them biting yeah. and the fact that they're venomous. So it's, it's, it put simply, that's, that's the way it is. Um, and, yeah, um, I do have another point. You're good, you're good. No, nah, that's right, we'll move on. But, yeah, <laughs> put, put, put um, very, very simply, uh, they're not trying to use venom for defensive purposes. That's what I wanted to say. If you were a rat, if you were one of its prey items, then it would envenomate 100% of the time because it's trying to use its venom on you. So we can all relax. We can realize that snakes aren't trying to prey on us. They're trying to defend um, their personal safety from us. Yeah, it was always crazy. I used to have a black-headed python and he was a bit of a nut job inside the cage. For some reason, he was very cage defensive. You get him out and he was like a puppy, but in the cage, in his, in his home, and I, I don't know if it was associated with this is my space and when you come in, you're invading it. But he would always like strike. But again, I'd put my hand in there sometimes and he'd hit my hand and not actually latch on. But then the moment that you put a rat in there that was, you know, frozen dead, you put it in there mm. and he would just completely change and just be as vicious as. And it was it was interesting seeing those two different kind of behaviors between the defensive go away kind of striking. Mm-hmm. But yep. then when he's actually turned on and, and wants the thing that he's after. Yeah, well, that that's extremely easy to explain because... Um you've got this snake in a confined space, so it can't really escape. It doesn't have that option. So that's where cage defensiveness comes in. The snake is cornered. Yep. Um, it sees this big sort of large uh, threatening-looking thing in front of it. It gets cage defensive. Then what comes in is chem- their, their chemio reception. Yep. So they're very, very good at picking up uh, scent particles of their prey items, and that's what they use their forked tongue for. Um as soon as you introduce the smell of that rat into the snake's environment, yeah. it just just it switches into prey mode, and that's exactly the switch that you're talking about. Seeing that is frightening, especially when you know you've held the rat in your hand. And like my my um girlfriend at the time would be like, "Oh, just feed him with your hand," and I'm like, "Screw that, yeah. dude! I'm using the yeah. tweezers. Yeah. <laughs> if he bites, he's not letting go." <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's why that's why a lot of keepers are at risk. Um, if they don't use safe practices. And I'll, I'll talk about the inland Taipan, uh, for example. Um, it's, you know, going back to that list of the most toxic snakes in the world, it ranks as number one. But the, the, the very simple fact is it's in the middle of Australia and hardly encounters anyone. Exactly. Um, so the only people that have been bitten by this snake, are, you know, guys like myself who have been out there trying to photograph it or study it. Uh, and then you've got the uh, keepers um, that keep them, um, you know, in captivity, and they're the types of people that get bitten. So you got this snake with this really scary um, statistic that it's the most venomous snake in the world. If you're a mice, yeah, sorry, if you're mice or rats, and then no one's ever died from it. <laughs> really? So no one's actually ever died from a, ty- a taipan bite or an inland taipan bite? Well, an inland taipan bite, yeah. People have definitely died from coastal taipans. Yeah. Uh, and there's one third species of taipan, which is called the Western Desert taipan, yeah. um, which is even more further inland if you're on the east coast it's over in the great victoria desert yep Uh, and yeah that was a that was a snake that i went and actually found um last year and and wrote an article for and and got into australian geographic which was a great a great feat but less than 20 people have actually encountered that snake in the wild because it's in such uh, I i should say less than 20 um people involved in Western science. I'm sure the uh, local Aboriginal people have been encountering that snake for yep. thousands, thousands of years. But, you know, it was only known to science in, in 2007. Oh, wow. That recently? That recently, yeah. And and I guess that's, that's why it was interesting to Australian Geographic because they're like, cool, we need people to go and find out more about this snake. If you're going to go in there and take photos of it, we want to know about it. So, so yeah. moving on to encounters, have you had any, obviously you've had a few sort of dodgy encounters, what happened and what do you need to do if you want to get bitten by a snake <laughs> and what should you do to avoid it? <laughs> well, when it comes to encountering snakes, I, I obviously shoot with a wide angle lens and I get very, very close to my subjects in order to show all of the detail and show the habitat that, that they live in so I can then go and use those photos to tell the story. So I deal in close proximity to snakes, um, you know, for long periods of time um, and I get around Australia and I film as many as I can. So I've 
basically come across all of our, you know, venomous species. Um, well, groups of venomous species, brown snakes, black snakes, tiger snakes, taipans. I've found all three taipans in Australia, uh, which not many people have done. So I've got a, a wealth of experience with Australian venomous snakes, and, and that's what I'm trying to specialize in. It's my most um, uh, important sort of interest. Um, and from that, I've derived a, a lot of knowledge because and a lot of experience from um, having these encounters, uh, and now it's trying to get that knowledge out to the public. Um, because they're just so misunderstood. So to get back to your question and what you should do if you see a snake, uh, don't do what I do because I like to get very close uh, and I like to photograph them. So don't do that for starters. Um, but there's no reason why you can't walk away from uh, any kind of snake encounter uh, as long as you know the following steps. So um, this is an area of great confusion amongst the Australian public because they get told one thing and then they get told another but really, there's two methods you should do when you encounter a snake. If you see a snake at a distance, just leave it alone. Try and find an alternate route. Observe it if you're interested. Um, Use a zoom they, lens, a zoom yeah, lens, zoom not a wide-angle one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, if you're in close proximity to a snake, you've, you know, you've walked out of the chook shed and you're about to stand on one. Um, if at all possible, the first thing you should do is remove yourself from the vicinity. But sometimes it's too late. That snake is already way too close for you. And what might happen is the snake might rear up and look at you because it's just noticed you. This is where the Australian public need to use their uh, best judgment in this situation. If you can get out of there, get out of there, the snake will go back to doing what it was doing. If the snake rears up at you, what it's best to do is stay completely still because they're very responsive to movement. So the more you move around, the more that snake is going to then get defensive and, and react at you. So this is why killing snakes is such a dangerous activity. And there's a statistic out there that if you try and kill a snake, you know, with hand tools and, and you're getting sort of close to these animals, you're provoking it. You're trying to kill it. It's going to defend itself. Your and likelihood of being bitten just went through the roof. <laughs> and and the mentality of these these people that kill these snakes, like, oh, I'm just protecting my family. You know what I mean? And they, and you get this statistic out there that, that actually proves that because the most amount of uh, Australians that that are bitten are these adult males yeah. trying to confront and kill the snake. So first first things first, if you want to survive a snake encounter, don't try and kill it. Yeah, that, that's the first thing. Call someone um, to remove it if it's in your on your property too, right? Exactly. Like, um, you know, th this can create a little bit of a problem for people that are in rural areas. Yep. Um, so that's why so many farmers just kill the snakes because they just want them to be eliminated. But the problem is that it's a Band-Aid solution. So it's um, not actually solving their perceived snake problem. They're Which just is pretty quick. dumb, right? If you've got a heap of crap in your yard that they can live in, you've got heaps of rats and mice living around your house, killing one snake isn't going to tell the other snakes to not come in. It's like, oh, okay, there's space open now. No one's living here at this address. I'll move in. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much what happens. You've created this, uh, this niche for other snakes then to come and exploit. So imagine a, a bit of a case study. Let's say we follow a brown snake from, from birth um, it knows exactly where all, you know, as it grows up, it knows where the food is, it knows where the shelter is, it knows where the danger is. So it tries to stay out of your way because it doesn't want to be preyed upon. Uh, it wants to remain in secrecy so it can hunt um, and then go and live, you know, in a hole somewhere. And, and they do very a very good job at staying out of our way. So you take that brown snake who's lived uh, in that area uh, and then all of a sudden he gets to adulthood, he gets big and he gets noticed and farmer comes and kills the brown snake. Yeah. What happens then is you've removed that top predator. <laughs> Who is keeping from, out the other 10 snakes. <laughs> from that environment. You know, he's the top predator in his environment. He's cleaning up all your rats and mice that if they are left to breed on their own, potentially can reach plague proportions and then affect your livelihood. They're eating all your dog food. They're eating all yeah. your crops. You know, um, there has been instances where there's been plague proportions, you know, and people have been overrun by mice. And I've even heard of a story about an old fellow who couldn't get out of bed who had his ears, eye, you know, they started to eat him alive basically Jesus. Um, because he couldn't get out of bed. So these type of things can happen um, if you start to change the, the land so much and remove the top predators. Then it, then it brings in other snakes. So other snakes say, oh, look, there's a food source there. 
there's so many of them, we need more snakes. Mm. So you might have more snakes in there. And this isn't to say it's going to happen every time, but this is basically what you're doing by just killing a snake because you fear and misunderstand it. You just don't know enough about the animal to, to go, oh, maybe we should leave this guy around and we should take a few other precautions. Now, I'm not saying, you know, it's great to have a brown snake around because they do pose a risk to people if those people don't know how to live cohesively with snakes. Especially but, if you've got kids, I imagine, or dogs or... Yes, yes. And, but the thing is that the whole, oh, I'm protecting my kids mentality is it's blown so much out of proportion because you'll get the odd child that is, uh, say, bitten by a snake or even, you know, in worst case scenario, and this is a tragedy, don't, don't get me wrong, um, but then the media get a hold of it and they yeah. blow it so far out of proportion. Then everyone just whips into a frenzy and starts the snake hate again. It is when, pretty weird, right? And they be, they would not blink putting their kid into the car. Say that again. Sorry. It, it is pretty funny that they we have those kinds of visceral yeah. reactions to snakes and spiders and sharks and uh, yeah. crocodiles. And yet we don't blink if we put our kids in the car or mm -hmm. we take our kids to a friend's house who's got a big backyard pool with no fence. There's no yeah. kind of... You don't freak out and, you know, oh, my gosh, I need to blow up this pool and, like, we're going to invert yeah. this car and, like, set it on fire to protect the kids. Yeah. And yet, yeah, with true. snakes, it's kind of like, yeah, as you say, there's, like, two deaths a year, which are probably both farmers or people in such, you know, restricted areas that are just so far away from the hospital that, for whatever reason, they didn't make it there, right? Well, what's probably more of uh, the attributing factor is they didn't know what to do once they were bitten. Yeah. So, if you want to protect yourself and your family from snakes... We have these amazing medical facilities. We have anti-venom. Um, you know, these are all the contributing factors that, that are the reason why we have such uh, small amounts of death in Australia from it. But the people who, who are, you know, dying from snake bites, generally speaking, are people who just don't know what to do after a bite. So yeah. this is where education comes in, and this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, a, to help the species that I love but also to help people. You know, as I mentioned before, I'm a full-time firefighter. Um, I care about public safety. So what my mission is to do is um, stop the conflict between our native wildlife and, and people. So I'm on both sides, um, yeah, and a lot of people sort of, you know, I get a lot of hate on the internet because, you know, I might, I might appear to be sticking up for a snake when really I'm trying to educate the people about the snake so then they can take that knowledge away and use it, you know, in a positive way. You gotta be careful, man. The the internet's a cesspool of hate. I get it if I if I drop the odd uh, f bomb or something. I got a lot of people. You shouldn't be saying that, mate. And I'll be like, Whoop, it's yeah. English, dude. Like, chill out. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I'm teaching people English. So what happened? Can you tell us the story about when you were bitten and how many times has it been? Can I ask that, or is that one of those things where you don't you don't ask a girl her age and you don't ask a guy no, how many times no, he's been bitten no, by a snake? No. It's, it's actually the the most common thing I get asked is people want to know, oh, how many times you've been bitten, but. Or it's not going to Look, be like, right, um, right. What's, what's the professor's name, Fry or whatever, who's been bitten like 30 times and he's like, yeah, you know. <laughs> oh, there's there's people I know that have been bitten around 100 times, you know, like it's... That's, and, a, that's <laughs> probably, what, a million dollars worth of anti-venom, you know? <laughs> well, you know, um, you know, that one person that I'm referring to actually just waits out bites, but, you know, I don't actually recommend that and we won't get on to that topic <laughs> <laughs> probably wants to, you know, be, be uh, remained anonymous, but... Um, all good, all good. So, what happened with you, though, when you were bitten by Australia's most venomous snake? Well, look, it wasn't Australia's most venomous snake. It was a mulga snake, or a.k.a. King, a king brown, yep. which is part of the black snake family. A lot of people don't realize that it's a black snake. And they don't have the most toxic venom, but they make up for it in sheer volume. Mm. Uh, and I was really lucky. I was um, I was trying to rescue a small, you know, mulga snake. It was about 30 centimeters long, uh, and it was on a busy road. So you know, whenever I'm out looking for reptiles, you know, you try and take them off the road because road trains just come along and and clean them up. Yeah. So remove this snake from the road. And look, if I was doing this job professionally uh, at someone's house, I would just use a welding glove to grab a snake that small and that venomous. Um, out in the bush, um, didn't think twice. I was trying to remove it off the road. Actually, removed it off the road successfully. It came back onto the road. I quickly went to grab it, but it was it was almost preempted my grab. As I grabbed it, it spun around and bit me on the pinky finger. Now, as I said before, these snakes make up for their um, 
toxicity uh, by injecting a lot of venom as they have the biggest venom yield of any Australian snake. So a big one is actually, um, you know, a bit of a worry if one of those chews on you. But this one just gave me a small defensive bite. It only got one fang in. Yep. Um, and I basically sat there for a minute because I had a great night of, um, you know, photography and reptiling lined up with a mate. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was only at the very start of the night. And it was such a hot night. There was reptiles all over the road. You just like, gonna... do I roll the dice? Maybe it's a dry bite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I actually, I sat there for a minute, but I knew from knowing about snake venom, uh, I knew that the mulga snake's venom is painful. So I sat there for about 30 seconds to a minute. And then when I started to feel pain from the mm. bite, I'm like, all right, let's wrap this up and get to the hospital. Lucky for me, the hospital was only 15 minutes away in the car. So we quickly applied the, the compression bandage, which is your, your standard snake bite first aid. And how did uh, you do that? How do we do it? So it started from the bite site, which was down on the finger. So it was very easy. You just start at the extremity and work your way up as, as high into the groin or armpit um, as, you, as you can get. And you're wrapping uh, about a third. You're going up about a third of the bandage each time. Um, and your the pressure that you should use uh, is similar to a sprained ankle just to support it. So all you're doing is compressing the lymphatic system. You are not cutting off the blood. Yep. This is a, a common misconception about you know what you should do because people used to go and do silly things like put tourniquets on their arm. Then they got to the hospital, realized it was a non-venomous snake, and they had to chop their arm off. So, <laughs> I can't imagine uh, how embarrassing that would be. Or it was like, yeah, mate, it was a dry bite, but uh, your arm's you know, been denied oxygen for the last two hours, so we're going to have to amputate. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep, because you didn't follow you know, proper snake bite protocol. So, you know, I've been in this situation before. The friend that I was with had been in it before. We knew what to do. We knew how calm to stay. Uh, and then basically he drove me to the hospital because uh, we're in a remote location. We didn't want to use up their resources by calling out an ambulance to us. Yep. Uh, it was just quicker and easier and um, better for everyone that he got me to the hospital via the car. But and you would say to other people, make sure you call an ambulance. Well, this is the thing. If you're in a remote location, what you might want to consider is um, meeting the ambulance. Yep. Um, so, you know, if, if the ambulance has to come an hour and you have to come an hour, yep. um, you might be able to meet the ambulance in the middle instead of having that ambulance come all the way out to your property, which is, you know, 200 kilometers away and, and you're just sitting there. So, you know, it is very important to stay immobilized when you're in the car. So moving um, is basically your enemy when you're bitten by an Australian snake. And that's um, because it facilitates the movement of the venom in the uh, lymph nodes, right? So that it'll go... It'll get further into your system. Exactly. So the venom, say I'm bitten in the pinky finger, the venom has to travel vertically up my arm until it reaches my lymph node in my armpit, and then it will be transferred into the blood. So the because Australian snakes have very short fangs, venom isn't injected past the skin. It's it's trapped in the skin, and that's where the lymphatic fluid uh, brings it up the arm into the bloodstream. So what can happen is you can... If you do this procedure, uh, you know, to the T and you follow it correctly, you can have vital hours um, before needing to reach antivenom. And this is what happened to me, um, bitten on the finger, uh, went to the hospital. Um, it was something like seven hours before I reached an antivenom because no the kidding. hospital that I went to, yeah, the hospital I went to didn't have black snake antivenom, um, and they didn't have what we call a polyvalent antivenom, which has all five types of antivenom mixed into the one, so that yep. it's used if they can't identify the snake. Yeah. So they just go, okay, here's the broad spectrum antivenom. It's going to cover all snakes. Um, so they didn't have any of that. All they had was brown snake antivenom, um, which would have actually done some good, but it was no, it was no use. You know, I was, I wasn't showing any symptomatic signs that the venom was in my system. Uh, and basically, the Royal Flying Doctors came to my aid, uh, and they flew me back to Perth, which was a thousand kilometres by road. So it was about seven hours before I reached anti venom, and then the attributing factors that that led to me not needing anti venom in the end was the fact that I had only been bitten by a baby snake. Yep. Uh, it only gave a small amount of venom. Uh, I stayed super calm. I knew what to do, um, 
and then I didn't move my arm, not even a muscle, for seven hours. So the venom <laughs> that must have been difficult. It was difficult, but you know, I knew that that's what I had to do. So don't no, don't move a muscle, don't tense anything, and the venom has got a lot more chance at staying localized to um, where where you've been bitten. And so, what happens if you were to get bitten like that by that snake? Can you just wait out the venom? I don't know if you would call it disintegrating or anything like that. If you were to bandage your arm up and you, you for whatever reason, couldn't get to a hospital or get anti venom, would it, would it potentially just get out of your system eventually, or you're pretty much screwed and you need to do something about it? Well, you have to do everything you can do um, because you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So. If you're bitten by a snake and, and you're just a member of the general public and you can't even identify that snake, you just have to go into snake bite first aid mode. So yep. you just follow, you know, the 10 or 12 simple steps in snake bite first aid uh, and then get yourself to hospital. Now, a lot of people ask me, oh, what if you're in the bush and you're by yourself because everyone's fear thinks of the worst scenario possible. And they're like, what if you're in the bush and you're by yourself um, and no one is there to help you. So in this scenario, uh, it's counterproductive to just put on the bandage and stay immobilized. Um, if you do this and it's an extremely you know, toxic snake and you've been given a decent amount of venom, um, you, know, you, know, you might sit under a tree for five hours and then you're eventually going to die anyway. You should have brought a um, shovel. <laughs> so you're not allowed to say the shovel word around me. <laughs> <laughs> Triggered, uh, triggered. Bearing yourself, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's counterproductive to then follow snake bite first aid to a T where they say stay immobilized. Mm. You need to then get to safe. You need to then get to help. So if you're, you know, in the bush and you're half an hour away from, from home, you would need to put on that, um, that bandage, that compression bandage, and then you would need to s- calmly make your way up to the house trying not to keep your your, your um, heart rate and your, your um, limb moving too much. Because that's so, going to make the, the venom move. And obviously also avoiding as many snakes on the way back to the house as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't try and, you know, <laughs> kill the snake that bit you and then get bitten several more times as well and then decide you're going to run up to the house and by then, you know, the venom's already in your system and you have a lot less chance of surviving. Far out. Well, man, I've got so many questions for you. We've already gone for 45 minutes. I'll have to get you on again and harass you about cane toads and a few other things. Um, but how, how did you get into the photography side of that, of, of reptiles and everything? And, and what have you sort of learned about them since doing that? Well, as I said, I started with the snake catching side of things and it, and it just wasn't, it wasn't um, fulfilling enough for me to continue doing that when I moved over to Perth. It's run a bit differently over here. Uh, and I'd always wanted to be a wildlife photographer. So in my own unique way, I just combined combined my love of travel, photography, and reptiles in into one sort of passion. Uh, and then it came a bit of obsession over the last few years. And, you know, I've been spending all my spare time on, you know, on, ca- <laughs> on travel, on camera gear, on fuel money, on everything. Um, <laughs> as well as launching the, the Instagram, the Facebook, the online shop, yeah. um, all the social media outlets to then go, you know, hey, this is all the photography I'm getting. This is what you can learn by looking at a nice image of this animal. So, um, But I do, it all for, I do it all for the passion and the love of it. Um, if I, I can then come back with a, with a beautiful photo that someone wants to buy and hang on their wall, that, that is, you know, uh, quite humbling that someone wants that uh, piece of your art in their home. But it's a very small reason why I do it. It's just basically the cherry on top if I can educate the public with my photos and then, you know, sell a few prints, which goes towards more camera gear and fuel money. <laughs> oh, brilliant, mate. Where can people find out more about you then? Where can they uh, follow you? Well, you can follow me at Ross McGibbon Reptile Photography on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Instagram as Ross McGibbon Photography. Um, and then I also have a website. Uh, which is rmrphotography.com.au. 
Yeah, go check it out, guys. Definitely Facebook, man. I love the videos, and that was where I first came across you. I think it was... I follow wild man Damien Duffy, right? I've had him on the podcast before. He's a classic, and he's always like, oh, spewing amazing with your stuff every time it gets up. I don't know if it's him that likes it or I like it, and then I sit like it starts popping up in my feed all the time, but you got some amazing videos in there, mate, so definitely keep it up, and guys, go check it out. So, All right, thanks very much for having me on today, man. It's been a great chat. No, I'll have to get you on again. Thanks so much for us. I appreciate it. No worries.